Well, my dear friends, I hope you're all having a lovely holiday season and that you got whatever presents it was that you desired. Well, as they say, no rest for the wicked. And that must make me a very wicked boy indeed, because here I am, back with another story for you in the middle of holiday season. Well, I just couldn't resist doing this one. A fantastic cryptid tale for you this evening from a new author whose work I haven't previously touched on. So, I think more than ever, you deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and, once again during this holiday season, listen. I won't give my name here, simply because if you have any interest in the paranormal, cryptozoology, or freakishly bizarre and unexplainable occurrences, you would recognise my work. If you believe in this shit, I'm your worst freaking nightmare. I will say that I'm a married woman in my early 30s living in New England. And my wife is my investigative partner. For the purpose of this story, we'll call my wife Diane. Oh, that's all you need to know about me, as I am not the subject of this event. To clarify, I do not believe in cryptids, ghosts or monsters. I've dedicated my life to disproving fraudulent, pseudo-scientific information being spread about things that don't exist. Through the years, billions of dollars have been wasted investigating such wild claims. The saddest part, for me, is all the people who've wasted their lives on something they truly believed in. Then again, you could argue that I've wasted my life on something, determined to destroy the frauds you see in the media. I'm... Uh, professional debunker, so to speak. Throughout my years, I've outed many psychics, cryptozoologists, and general con artists. I've destroyed their careers. Ever wonder what happened to all those ghost hunting shows and why they never last long? They're staged, and I can prove it. I've proven it time and time again, but that's a story for another day. I guess you can say this story began, well, for me anyway, in mid to late 2003. I was in Mexico for a month, researching a series of cryptid sightings that I won't get into too much detail about. Basically, I spent a month chasing down leads and eventually staked out the locations, only to disprove it by capturing the uh, creature. <laughs> it was a rabid dog. Some people will put you through hell if they think they can make a quick cameo on the local news. I got a call from our office, as Diane was driving us back to the United States, where we would return the rental car, hop on a plane to New England, and write a very angry article on the fraudulent news reporting. One of our researchers got his hands on a few police reports filed in upstate New York, both of which were from the same couple. Now, the public has a tendency to think that police report translates into evidence to be used as fact. He gave me a summary of the reports, but names had been redacted. That piqued my interest, as typically the names of these people are out there in the open because, well, they want attention. The first report was for a missing child, the couple's son. The family owned a large home with a lot of land, and allegedly the father was watching his son outside when he became distracted with a newspaper. The father noticed his young boy heading into the woods, and he called for him to stay in the yard. The father then proceeded to get distracted again for approximately three minutes. At this point, he looked up from his newspaper, and his child was gone. The father didn't immediately panic, assuming the little boy couldn't have gone far. He entered the woods at approximately 3.15pm to look for his son. After five or ten minutes, the father began to panic. He decided to run inside to call the police, but on his way back, he saw a yellow piece of fabric on the ground about 20 feet away from where he was walking. He remembered his son had been wearing a yellow shirt and hurried to the object, finding that the shirt had been torn to pieces and was soaked with blood. Police were called and search parties were launched. Within the next three days, 
they found one of the boy's shoes and his baseball. The boy's body has never been found. I was skeptical as to where my researcher was going with this. So, a kid ran off into the woods and got himself mauled by a bear or something. How did this concern me? The second report was filed six days after the boy's disappearance. The couple also had a daughter, who was two years younger than her brother. She slept in a bedroom across the hall from their bedroom, located on the second floor of the house. The father came into the bedroom, complaining about hearing noises that appeared to be coming from the attic. The couple assumed it was an animal and went to bed. A few hours later, at approximately 2.35 a.m., the couple awoke to a loud crash coming from somewhere in the house. The parents were immediately on their feet, rushing to check on their daughter, who was now screaming. The parents entered the bedroom and saw a crouched, hairless figure with grey skin and sunken black eyes. It was hovering over their daughter's bed. The creature caught sight of them and crawled out of the now broken second-story bedroom window. The mother rushed to her daughter, who was dead, while the father was on the phone with the operator. Her body was completely mangled, but my researcher spared me the details. At first, I laughed at him. I know it sounds harsh, but I was not about to get involved in two parents guilty of killing both of their kids and blaming some monster in the woods. My researcher insisted that he only brought it up because sightings of this creature had been reported all throughout New England. I asked for a more in-depth description of what we were looking for, and my researcher paused for a long moment. Here's the thing, he said, coughing quietly before continuing. This isn't exactly recent. Yes, there have been an uptick in accounts in New England, but this definitely mirrors a lot of classical folklore. The people up in New England are calling this thing the rake for some reason I'm unsure of. I muffled a laugh. <laughs> the rake? Is this a joke? We can't find a source on where the name came from, he sighed, but similar accounts have been reported by the Navajo reservations on the other side of the country, but they call them... <sighs> Skinwalkers, I sighed, cutting him off. God, will they give it up already? It's been debunked for several reasons, the primary being that it's described as being a witch using animalistic forms, but if it were in the shape of an animal, all the vocal cords wouldn't be able to... Emulate voices, yeah, I know, he said. But the physical description is there regardless. Then again... Leave Navajo legends out of this. I've seen some people claim a stray dog was really a skinwalker. None of those accounts are credible, as it's the whole, oh, my uncle's cousin's sister's neighbor kind of bullshit. <sighs> Urban legend. At least be respectful about it, I joked. These people actually believe this. I'm in the business of debunking frauds, not religions. Yeah, I know, I know he said. You and Diana are scheduled for a cabin in Vermont tomorrow afternoon. You'll be there from tomorrow until next week Sunday. Ten days should be fine. It's in the middle of freaking nowhere. And every single resident of this bullshit excuse for a town has supposedly seen the rake. They've basically closed off half the town because they're terrified. You'll be in the epicenter where the first sightings occurred. The family is evacuated, and you have a lot of ground to cover. It's a big property. I sighed. Explain to Diane that we wouldn't be home for almost another two weeks, and had to wait at the airport for three hours to get on a flight to Vermont, instead of our original destination. Then there was the issue of spending hundreds of dollars to check all of the baggage with cameras and equipment. <laughs> we never travel light. Fast forward to us arriving on the side of a small town in Vermont, that had been virtually quarantined by a local, small-town police chief with nothing better to do with his time. I showed him my credentials, he promised to pray for us, and I rolled my eyes. The cabin was large, but 
it was by no means luxurious. I let Diane stay in the house and unpack everything, while I spent two hours setting up our equipment as far into the surrounding woods as I was willing to go. Waste of time, now that I think about it. Waste of freaking time. That night, I let Diane sleep as she had been driving like crazy for the past month. I sat in front of our command station and, with the help of a case of energy drinks, watched the monitors all night. We had 62 cameras I had to constantly be checking. At around one in the morning, I finally found something. All in the span of about 10 minutes, 47 of our cameras had been inactive. This means the cameras were not recording, but had most likely been severely damaged, likely beyond repair. In all my years, nothing like this had ever happened before. Sure. I've lost a few devices here and there, and occasionally a couple would go offline temporarily, but these cameras had clearly been tampered with. I was livid. I firmly believed that some local hicks were fucking with my equipment to try and scare me off, and I was having none of that. I put on some warm clothes, was quiet as to not wake Diane, and realized I had no choice but to go see what the hell was going on. I didn't believe in God at the time, but I know a higher power was looking out for me that night. Not only did I remember the combination to our gun safe, but I had the sense not to bring Diane with me. My greatest fear is losing Diane, and as she's asthmatic, she wouldn't have been able to run. She would have died that night, like I almost did. I don't know why. But I kept the gun loaded. I was originally planning to use it to scare off whatever rednecks were fucking with over $250,000 in equipment. Well, something in my gut told me to load it, check it twice and put extra rounds in the pocket of my trench coat. I carried a small but very bright flashlight and began my journey into the surrounding woods. I immediately headed in the direction of the damaged cameras. It took me about 20 minutes to finally reach the location of the damaged cameras. Along the way, all the cameras I checked were functioning. I jogged most of the way, only stopping to examine equipment. And well, now, I didn't feel good about leaving Diane alone in the house with a bunch of crazed hillbillies running around. When I reached the first set of damaged audio and video equipment, I instinctively cocked my gun. No. Rednecks could have done this amount of damage. These cameras were mauled, and half of them appeared to have been bitten. I realize now, it may have been because they definitely appeared to be out of place. They were red in comparison to the green and brown surroundings. This would likely make them a target to any real predators. For the first time in my life, I began to believe in something without seeing it firsthand. With a shaky hand, I reached in my pocket and pulled out my audio recorder that I used for memos. If I was going to die in these woods, I would leave Diane one final message. I whispered into the recorder, letting her know why I was out there, what I initially was thinking, what I saw, and that I loved her more than anything in this world. Tears filled my eyes as I turned off the recorder, realizing that... If the stories were true, Diane would never get to hear my last words. The recorder would likely be lost, gone the same way my body would be. Holding my gun at the ready, I began backtracking, tried to stay as silent as possible. The realization that no human could do such damage to my equipment left me praying that I would make it back to the cabin. I was going to freaking take Diane, and we would hide in the crawl space until morning. I stopped walking when I heard a very strange sound coming from somewhere to my left. It wasn't consistent with human footsteps. It sounded more erratic, less controlled. Whatever it was, it sounded like it was walking on more than two limbs, and it was moving fast. 
In a flash, I turned to face the noise, standing my ground as my training had taught me. I had the upper hand. I'd loaded a firearm, and this animal, this creature, couldn't hurt me. At least, that's what I kept trying to tell myself. With quivering hands, I stared into the trees, catching a glimpse of something grey. My researcher's words replayed in my mind, but I didn't want to get trigger happy and kill some hick just having a laugh. Show yourself, I screamed, standing my ground and masking my terror. I've got a gun. And this was when it happened. All at once, this creature, the rake, emerged from the bushes and trees. It moved so unnaturally, limbs flailing and looking like something out of that movie, The Grudge. It just didn't move like any animal I'd ever seen before. It was hunched over and about three feet tall in that position, leaving me to believe that if it could stand up straight, it would tower over me at around six or seven feet. Now, I'm a tall girl, but I had nothing on this thing. I think my aggressive yelling caught it off guard, and I think the flashlight confused it. It let out a high-pitched cry, and for a brief moment, I thought it actually feared me. <laughs> I was dead wrong. It wasn't a wail of fear. It was a battle cry. In two seconds, the thing was about two feet away from me. I unloaded my entire clip, shooting at it wildly and missing most of my shots. One shot, however, appeared to hit it in the arm or the shoulder. I couldn't be sure. Wherever I hit it, it slowed it down substantially. I didn't waste time. I turned around and hauled ass, reloading my gun as my combat boots sunk into the mud beneath my feet. After I made it a few yards, I heard it running after me, but slower this time. I turned around for a brief moment, emptying the second clip on the thing. This time, it ran behind a tree. Once again, I ran and reloaded. I didn't hear it following me, but I didn't slow down. Before I knew it, I'd burst through the back door of the house and locked it. I ran into the hallway and began pushing a massive bookcase in front of the door. I made so much noise, Diane came running down the stairs. I didn't have time to explain, so I reached in my pocket, handed her my recorder, and told her to listen to the last ten minutes. I had to physically grab my wife by the arm as I pulled down the staircase from the ceiling. I shoved her up the stairs, refusing to hear any of her demands for answers. All I kept repeating was four simple words. Listen to the tape. Once I was sure Diane was secure in the crawl space, I grabbed both sides of her face and kissed her for a long moment. I had to defend her, even if it meant losing my life to do so. She'd already heard most of what had happened from the recording, and sobbed loudly, begging me to hide with her. I told her I would protect her, and closed the staircase, trapping her inside. I darted to the control station, and realized my server was completely down. That meant, in short, that I could see the six remaining cameras surrounding the house, but they would not record. I heard Diane sobbing quietly, but I knew that was because I was in the room right below her crawl space. I searched desperately to find the heavy-duty guns we kept for emergencies like these. It took me several attempts to get the combination on the locks right because of how shaky my hands were. I watched the cameras, loading my rifle and lighting a cigarette. I grabbed a half-empty bottle of scotch from the dresser and took a long swig. I nearly spit it out when I saw the creature crawling on one of the cameras. Then, another. It was circling the house, but it seemed injured. Twenty minutes before the sun came up, the creature was gone, and I'd packed everything we had, keeping a close eye on the cameras. Armed to the teeth, I brought everything to the car. 
I didn't want Diane to panic. The moment the sun illuminated the world, I got Diane out of the crawl space. I kissed her repeatedly as she slapped me on the chest for not letting her help. I basically dragged her into the car and we got the hell out of Dodge. We weren't able to salvage any of our cameras. We lost over 250 grand in equipment, but we made it out alive. After that, Diane and I decided we finally wanted a baby. We tried dozens of times to write a response to the stories about the rake on our website. To this day, the cryptid article on the website is the only one listed as status probable. Wow, brilliant story that one. I really enjoy the uh, cryptid works. I don't do them that often, but whenever I do, I um, really enjoy doing them. Hope you enjoy them as much as I do. If not, well, you know, there'll be a new story along in a couple of days, so never mind. But if you like that one, please let me know your comments, feelings and thoughts in the comment section below the vid. And with any luck, I'll have a day off in a day or so, and I'll be able to reply to as many as I can. Until then, you keep enjoying those holidays, okay? I'll be back again on Friday. Until then... Sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>